Imagine you're standing at the front of your mat. You've just arrived at class, and the very first movement that you make is to reach your arms overhead. I don't think that's so problematic. I think we often reach our arms up overhead to say, screw in a light bulb or get something off of a shelf. The next move, and this is the first I'll suggest significant move in a sun salutation, is to fold forward and down from mountain pose in which the legs are straight to Uttanasana standing forward fold in which the legs are straight. And it is often taught in just that way. And indeed, many, especially very flexible students, keep their legs very fully straight and strong while other students looking around are going, ah, oh, that's what I should be doing. And I found that over the years to be somewhat difficult to get students who I know have tight hamstrings and I know have low back issues to bend their knees. So I played around with this and played around with this over the years and finally came up with a very simple solution to play with. And it is this, borrow chair pose from Sun Salutation B and initiate Sun A with chair. Thus, we now in the first movement, inhale, bend the knees, flex the knees, flex the hips, reach the arms overhead, chair pose, ut katasana. And then as students are folding forward and down, I say, please consider keeping your knees bent. And what happens? Almost all students keep their knees bent. Some of those more flexible, press their legs straighter as they're folding all the way forward and down. I'm guessing that they feel okay with it. Many keep their knees bent. So that's one example of a sun salutation remix. Having done several sun salutation A's, uh, with the chair pose, also at the other end of the salutation, that's coming home. You've jumped or stepped back to the front of the mat to half forward fold, Ardha Uttanasana, and then fold it down to full Uttanasana. And the next move coming up, not come all the way up with straight legs. Do chair pose again. Easier, far easier for everyone, anyone, pretty much, unless you have significant knee issues, to come up with bent knees. So much better, especially for the lower back. Good. Having done a few sun salutation A's, two, three, four, five, the hamstrings, especially all those down dogs, as well as the forward folds, even with relatively bent knees, the hamstrings are both warmer and stretched a bit. So having done that, I suggest now we come to sun B. Don't do chair. Initiate it as you would A. Inhale the arms directly overhead, fold forward and down. I say, if you like, bend your knees again. And then we continue moving along, and I already mentioned this with respect to standing postures. We come to the first significant, as a really strong standing posture in the sun salutations, and that is warrior one, which again, I will not go into details of it right now because I went into it earlier on standing asanas. It is, with all respects, again, to the teachers who brought these practices to us, it is terribly ill-informed as a posture to do that early in the class because of the pressure in the back knee the ankle of the back leg, as well as issues to the hip and the lower back, but primarily the back knee and secondarily the lower back. So, um, crescent pose, Ashtachandrasana, eight point crescent moon pose, the difference, the heel is lifted. What do we lose? Some of the stretch to the outer lower leg, no question about it. Again, I'm not throwing away warrior one, I'm just doing it later in the class, uh, when prepared for it. Uh, so we're losing that. We're losing that intelligence of the greater active internal rotation of that leg to bring the hip forward. Well, that relates, as I mentioned earlier, to <clears throat> pigeon pose and nataraj and, and warrior three for that matter, um, to some degree, warrior three. And, and so with this, um, what, one's get, what one is lose, losing with that, uh, in addition to that, is lateral stability. That is, it is harder to balance in a crescent position with the heel lifted than in a warrior one. And so, in thinking about this, I also thought, well, hmm, maybe this isn't such a bad thing because so often, it's, it, that first 15 or 20 minutes of a class, students are tending to sort of look around more than maybe they might. And so there they are looking around and you can get away with it in warrior one because it's so stable. But if you start to look around, if you lose your drishti, your focus, your gaze in a crescent pose, you're very likely to lose stability and possibly fall. So in some ways, not to be manipulative with my students, by teaching them crescent pose rather than warrior one, it more naturally brings them into a place of dial in the focus and stay present with what you're doing. When we're doing sun salutations and we step or jump back to the front of the mat and we land in that half forward fold or thereabouts, we then fold back down, whether that's in sun A, sun B, or classical, Surya Namaskara. We fold back down. This in a practice where there's a lot of pressure in the wrist joints in which the wrists are almost always like this. 
And another part of my Sun Salutation remix is to suggest that when one folds back down, as you're on your, the way home to Mountain Pose, when you fold back down, that standing forward fold, just for the one second that you're there, do this. The Parahasta positioning, the, just, the, just do this on the floor or towards the floor. And that simple positioning helps to reduce the pressure in the wrist. And I recommend this all through practice. Perhaps you're in the middle of strong or whatever flowing sequence of standing postures and it's suddenly vinyasa time, chaturanga up dog, down dog. The moment my class comes back to the front of the mat, I cue them back to the front of the mat and they exhale and fold down. I say, consider placing the backs of your hands to the floor. Why not? Consider that question. Why not? Other micro sequences beyond, oh, also then, so sun salutation A, sun salutation B, for the classical form, adapted largely from Sivananda tradition, I learned it first from Eric Schiffman, um, my first teacher, um, and in that form, it is altogether easier than A and B. Uh, one is not doing chaturanga up dog, one is doing knees, chest, chin to the floor, ashtanga pranam to low cobra, low, modified chalabhasana B altogether easier for almost everyone. And so where I'm going with this is to suggest that if you are doing all, I highly recommend doing the classical before A or B. In any class, even an advanced class, it's a great way to just initially get into the entirety of the body in classical Suri Namaskar with that low lunge pose, Anjana Yasana in there, knees, chest, chin, that low cobra, waking up the muscles of the lower back, so much better when you then go into upward facing dog pose a little bit down the path. So those are some basic <coughs> suggestions, excuse me, relative to the sun salutation micro sequences. And again, there are other micro sequences such as dancing warrior. And with those, once again, we want to look closely at, well, what is really going on there and be aware. So as an exercise in this, I invite you to try doing a dancing warrior. Uh, and also try, try doing the, the wild thing form of, of Dancing Warrior um, and tune in to joints and ask yourself how well informed are these movements and positions for different conditions. I think that many people, myself, can do those forms, the dynamic, playful, joyful, beautiful dance-like set of forms in a, in a safe way, in a sustainable way. But I also think it's highly problematic, especially the wild thing form highly problematic for those with wrist and shoulder issues and tertiarily, thirdly, uh, low back. But especially where, the, where you're bearing weight, wrist, shoulder, and that wild thing, be aware and teach this awareness. Counsel being aware in this. So with this then, we have what I'm going to give you here and now at, to this point on interrelations of asana. 